for her to be extradited. Mariette spent her last few months on death row in a single cell with only a mattress for sleeping or relaxing and a bucket used for the restroom. Almost every day she was given tripe and morugo or cow intestines and spinach for her meals. She claimed to have constant nightmares and overall had a hard time with her last days on earth. Hello everybody, we are back with another reaction for Death Row Executions. If you guys haven't seen the last one there, make sure you go check that out. It was a really sad story. Uh, I'm sure this one's probably going to be just as sad and triggering, I should say, but uh, no doubt. let's do it. Okay, so tonight we'll be reacting to... Death Row Executions, Episode 49, Marriott Bosch Love, Triangle Gone Bad, South African Expat Living in Botswana. All right. Let's go in three, two, one. Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. New intro. I was just going to say, I love it. Oh yeah, that was good. That was good. It was. Hello, this is Air, and welcome to the 49th episode of Death Row Executions. Today's story is on Mariette Bosch, who was the first white woman hanged in Botswana. This story takes place in Pakalani, Botswana, which is a suburb near the capital Gaborone. 42-year-old Mariette Bosch and her husband Justin Bosch moved from Petersburg, South Africa to Palenque, Botswana in 1992 because of the diamond industry, the thriving economy, and lower crime rates. Mariette was born in 1950 and was used to the finer things in life because her father was an affluent liquor store owner. When she married her intimidating, short-tempered husband, life was not always as happy as they appeared. Justin cheated on Mariette, but the two agreed to remain married and had three children together. Jeez. The expat community the Boshes moved into was a white expat community filled with wealthy South Africans. Majority of the new homeowners in this private community had native Botswanian maids and garden boys. They were surrounded by golf courses, shopping plazas, casinos, and more. Mariette would enjoy all of these luxuries on a daily basis. The family even had two cars, with one of them being a brand new BMW. Yeah. Within the next two years after their move, Mariette had become a member of Botswana's high society. She also began to regularly attend the Dutch Reformed Church in the capital of Gaborone. Moving into the community near the Boshes was married couple Maria or Ria and her husband Tiani Wolmerens. The two women became best friends and even took classes together like baking class and a class for decorating porcelain dolls. Not only did Mariette and Ria develop a bond, but Mariette was secretly developing a bond with Rhea's husband, Tiani. Rhea and her husband had a rocky relationship during this time and ended up separating but getting back together after a year in 1994. The affair between Mariette and Tiani began in the beginning of 1995 and not too long after their affair started, Mariette's husband, Justin, passed away in a car crash. Wow. Now, home alone, Mariette became more obsessed with the idea of starting a relationship with Tiani and he promised to divorce Rhea so the two of them could be together. In the meantime, they would travel over four... Something about those eyes? I don't know why they... They look... Sinister. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not just do a... <laughs> See, that because of the channel name, but they need to... Be... They look haunting. They do. That's, that's it. All right, let's get back to this, guys. Three, two, one. We're hours away to Johannesburg, South Africa, to meet and have sex. 
A year had passed and Tiani had still not divorced his wife, so Mariette was growing more and more impatient. She confided in Tiani's sister-in-law, Judith Bosch, and told her that she loved Tiani and wanted to be with him. Judith was dumbfounded by this information because Judith knew that Mariette knew she was not fond of her. With her mind set, that Mariette knew she was not fond of her. With her mind set that she would be with Tiani, in June of 1996, Mariette drove to Petersburg, South Africa in hopes of obtaining a pistol from a friend. This friend had her late husband's collection, so she knew he would not question anything. The friend agreed, and the very next day she crossed the border back to Botswana, smuggling the gun with her. The same day she made it back home, she waited until nighttime to drive two blocks away to where Rhea and Tiani lived. Mariette then climbed a six-foot wall, walked through their back door where she saw Rhea in the hallway, aimed, and fatally shot her two times. Some accounts say she could have also had a spare key and walked right in. Rhea's daughter Myrna came into the house later that night and stepped on something large. She turned on the light and realized she was stepping on her mother. Myrna called for police, but by that time, Mariette had left and felt that she got away with the perfect crime because no one had suspected her. Initially, they thought it was the maid, but she was cleared. Tiani was also arrested and spent a night in jail before being released because he had an alibi. His co-workers said that he was far away on a job with them. Three months passed, and police believed it was a robbery gone bad and had no suspects or leads. Mariette gave the gun she used to Judith's husband, who also happened to be Tiani's brother, but they did not bring up anything to Judith. Three months after the death of Rhea, Mariette ordered a wedding dress from a designer. At the same time, Judith found out that her husband was given the pistol Mariette had used, and she put two and two together, coming up with the conclusion that Mariette took things into her own hands in order to be with Tiani. Judith then took the pistol to the police department, and not too soon after, Mariette was brought into the station for questioning. When detectives informed her that they had a weapon given to them, she yelled out, I pray the gun and the cartridges don't match. The detectives informed her that they did, and Mariette was subsequently charged with the murder of Rhea. Believing that Mariette was innocent, Tiani, his children, and Mariette's children supported her until the end. Mariette was hailed at Labatsi Prison, but 10 months after being locked up, the Dutch church she was a member of posted her bail. While out on bail, she and Tiani got married. She was free for 18 months until her trial started in December of 1999 at the Botswana Labatse High Court with Justice Isaac Aboyagye presiding over the case. While being held at Labatse Prison, Mariette refused to eat the customary tripe meals given to prisoners and ended up losing weight and looking you. thinner by the day each time she went into court. Defense tried to argue that Mariette could not have climbed over a wall, and Mariette testified that although she did borrow a gun, the person she got it from put a concoction in her drink which hypnotized her into doing bad things. She asserted that he was a dangerous man and that Rhea had discovered irregularities in his financial records. Her story then changed to him being responsible for the actual crime. A psychiatrist for the defense went on stand and testified that Mariette was an elite member of society and did not fit the profile of a killer, which was immediately dismissed by Judge Isaac. Mariette's daughters then took to the stand and lied under oath stating that their mother was home all day and night, which could not have been true if she had just crossed the border that day. Mariette's maid took the stand next and refuted everything the daughter said when she told everyone in court that Mariette left the house at 8 o'clock that night. Majority of the evidence during trial was circumstantial, but no one could argue the fact that she brought the gun from another country. While awaiting her sentence, many believed she would walk free, and Mariette herself said, God will deliver me from this nightmare. I have been framed, people have turned against me, but God will not. Tiani also believed his new wife would be okay and tried to convince others to reassure Mariette as well. One neighbor by the name of Stephanie Hugo said that Mariette was her friend and could not lie to her. She did not feel that Mariette was innocent or that she would get a light sentence. During trial, the judge made it aware without saying it that he believed Mariette was guilty. He laughed when questioning the psychologist about a hypothetical affair and love triangle. He also made aware of the fact that the psychologist, Dr. Louise, 
was a sex doctor for a popular magazine. The media was all over the case, and on February 21st, February 21st, 2000, Justice Isaac found Marriott guilty of premeditated murder. In Botswana, if anyone commits murder, the death penalty is mandatory unless extenuating circumstances arise, so Marriott was sentenced to death by hanging. While handing out the verdict, Judge Isaac said, I find that the accused and Tiani were seriously in love before the death of the deceased and that they wanted the deceased out of Tiani's way for them to get married. He also said, the crime was carefully planned with the motive of enabling you to take over the husband of the deceased. I have not been able to find one moral extenuating circumstance. You are not very young, you were not intoxicated, and you were not provoked. Mariette sunk her nails into her arms while her family had a more of a dramatic response in court. She was then taken to Gaborone Central Prison, and while awaiting her death, Mariette hired a British attorney by the name of Desmond De Silva, who was known for getting reprieves for more than 30 inmates. Desmond encouraged judges from England, Nigeria, Scotland, South Africa, and Zimbabwe, Commonwealth nations, to sit on the Botswana Panel of Appeals under the post-colonial judicial system, and he argued the fact that prosecutors did not disclose the fact that they gave immunity to a suspect if they agreed to testify against Mariette. Her appeal trial began on January 18, 2001, and ended the next day. It wasn't until January 20, 2001, Mariette found out her appeal was denied. After hearing the news, many people in the community rejoiced and danced in the street saying she was given a just punishment for her crime. Marriott's fate was not yet sealed because she still had not heard from the president of Botswana, Mr. Festus Mogay. Many believe that in a country that is pro-capital punishment, nothing would change the president's mind, and they were right because one week before her death, President Mogay failed to grant clemency. During her final moments, the government of South Africa also refused to intervene and did not ask for her to be extradited. Mariette spent her last few months on death row in a single cell with only a mattress for sleeping or relaxing and a bucket used for the restroom. Wow. Almost every day she was given tripe and morago or <clears throat> cow intestines and spinach for her meals. She claimed to have constant nightmares and overall had a hard time with her last days on earth. In Botswana, executions are carried out in secret, so with no warning, on March 30, 2001, Mariette was read her death warrant and was told she would die early the next morning, which was on a Saturday. Prison officials did not allow her to have any visitors, and they made no public statement beforehand, and she was not allowed to have a final meal. With this new information, Mariette spent her final moments writing letters to her husband, Tiani, and her children. The following morning at six o'clock, a priest, a prison doctor, and prison officials were the only witnesses to her death. Coincidentally, three weeks prior to her death, Tiani had scheduled a visit for Friday the 30th, but prison officials called him and let him know the visit had to be postponed due to an inspection and he would be able to come the following Monday. When he arrived the following Monday with his children, prison officials notified him that Mariette had already been hanged, so there were no final goodbyes. They were given Mariette's belongings and then they were asked to leave the prison. Tiani made a final statement to the press. The manner oh in which God. Mariette was yeah, executed was for totally the and completely indecent. I cannot fathom the reason for it. We had filed a petition for clemency. It was a preliminary petition in which we made clear to President Mogay that we needed time to prepare a full petition. We also told him that we were arranging for a psychiatrist to evaluate Mariette's state of mind. I believe the story they told us about an inspection was a lie. They will probably make up anything now. I found out the pastor who was visiting her every week was not allowed to see her on Friday. Mariette had nobody to comfort her, nobody to try and help her, to be with her in her final hours. Thank you guys for watching another episode of Death Row Executions, and I would like to give a shout out to Renatka. Thank you for making the intro for me. She actually made another one, and I'm excited to share that with you guys. Also, thank you to Rick Hardy for the intro voiceover. On to my Patreon side, thank you Sue for becoming a patron, and thank you to all of my patrons for helping me in the process of getting a new logo Double and an intro. Yes. I love all the feedback and interaction you guys gave me before introducing it to YouTube. And now for discussion and question time. 
I know with prisons in America, death row inmates usually get a decent meal and it's not the same meal every single day. Do you feel that Mariette's daily meal of tripe and spinach was not fair or do you think that it was completely fair? What do you feel about executions being held in private and loved ones not being able to say goodbye or being informed of the executions? <clears throat> I Don't think you guys that's find it odd that Tammy married his wife's and best friend? Yeah. I also find it odd that all of their kids believed her as well. I think some kids will believe anything their parents say, and I would not trust her or him. All right, guys. Make sure you guys head over to that channel and subscribe so you guys can be uh, updated just like we are all the time whenever a new video comes out. Thank you guys for all the support, and we will catch you next time, so keep it spooky.